You know, uh, before we're being General Boykin up here, uh, I want to tell a story that Paula White did tell about Donald Trump. Some of you were maybe at Zion last week. And she was asked, and she is his spiritual advisor. She was asked to attend one of his business meetings in the Trump Tower. And it was a multi-million dollar business deal. And he shook hands on the deal. And then he invited Paul to come in the car with his family, and his attorney called up. He says, we can't do this deal. And Trump told him, I shook the man's hand. End of story. He keeps his promises. There's something there that we have to realize. There's something inside. And you know, so we're citizens in heaven, but Paul used his citizenship. You're talking about voting and that. We got to use our citizenship and convince people. So after you hear the general here, we got to get these links sent out to people who are hanging on the, you know, on the edge right now with Bob share, what general's going to share. We can still turn a lot of votes here for people, for righteousness, because we're, there's four issues at stake. The courts, religious freedom, judges, and Roe v. Wade is going to come down. I believe it. The curse on the land will be lifted. It's our job. Now, as I share this, we're going to take a uh, JP. I want you to put envelopes on the table. We're going to take up an offering, but before, uh, I want you to give it to JP. You'll put uh, envelopes, make out checks to God and government. There's uh, credit card information. You can do a check, cash, whatever it is. I'm asking you to invest in the God and Government series. And I already know that we have uh, somebody, we're, we're going to build this program. And Bob, you're going to be part of this. You don't know it yet, but you're going to be part of this God, God and Government series. Uh, and I'm going to enlist Pastor Richard because of a conversation I had in his office earlier. We're going to change the dynamic. And after you hear the general, you're going to know why. But I was talking to General Carr this morning. I said, General, you're building a legacy for your kids and grandkids. And I said, my role is to build a legacy for my kids and grandkids when they can see grandpa and dad stood up for them. So they'll be a people of freedom and not in bondage. Now you're gonna say, well, I don't have the exposure of General Boykin or Bob Duco, even made the little I have. No, you have a sphere of influence that you have an exposure to. Build a legacy for your kids. Start today. And it's investing in your time, your talents, and your resources. And I'll tell you what, this is what it's all about here in this room. And so I'm asking you to invest in this series. We have expenses uh, overall. We wanna, I want to bless General Boykin. That's the bottom line. I want to bless him. He's going to California on Monday and uh, to speak with the pastors who are not allowed to meet, those who have been uh, uh, taken to court. He's out there encouraging these pastors. He's traveling all around everywhere. But General Boykin, we got to know him years ago. And he's on the board of Oak Initiative. He's the vice president of Family Research Council. This man here is, uh, he has a legacy that he has built. He was a, a founding member of the Delta Force. That's a special force team. He was a commander of the Green Berets. He worked for uh, intelligence under George Bush. He's been on the battlefield. He's got testimonies. He's got stories. I mean, tell you what, I mean, he's got a legacy. So again, I'm not begging you for money. I'm saying we're going to move this state to be pure mission again, and we're going to move this nation. It's in our hands. And so we are, I'm serious about this. This God and government thing, we're going to move hard and fast. So I say in Jesus' name, amen. And I want to bring up now uh, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Say that again. Okay, yeah, what? Uh, yes. Now? Yeah, let's do, let's do that. Okay. I'm, I'm just asking. I'm, I'm just... I want him to give the offering to JP at the back table. Oh, okay. Take it back. He'll take it. That way they might have a question about JP and this business idea he has, okay? Pastor Richard, I want you to come up here and pray for General Boykin before he speaks, okay? Let's honor this man, okay? Yes, Lord. Father, we thank you for General Boykin. Father, we thank you for a man of integrity, a man of courage. We uh, ask for your anointing to flow through him, Lord, to 
pierce the darkness, to bring clarity in a time of confusion. Lord, let your name be exalted and glorified tonight in Jesus' name. Everybody said. Amen. 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 Okay, thank you. Uh, General, don't mess up. Oh, for crying out loud. He does that to me every time. And Bob, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Very informative. Let me add two things to the accomplishments that I think are uh, quickly forgotten and don't get nearly enough credit. Number one, he recognized the Golan Heights yes. as sovereign Israeli territory. Do you realize that there is now a city, a town in the Golan Heights named after him? Yep. But the second thing is this, and very few Americans realize this. He actually wrote an executive order his first year in office that protected religious liberty in the executive branch. And every element of the executive branch has to write implementing instructions now as to how they're going to follow that executive order. Most pro-life, pro-religious liberty president probably in history. Amen. Certainly in the 21st century, or the 20th and 21st century for that matter. So, it's a pleasure to be with you here tonight. I do need to check my audience. Uh, do we have any Marines in here? Okay, we got two Marines in here. All right. I will not use any big words tonight, just so you know. Okay? I can't help it. It's in my DNA. So I got to tell you this Marine story since I got a couple Marines here. And by the way, I grew up around the Marine Corps. My dad spent 32 years with Marine Corps, and I grew up at Cherry Point Marine Air Station. But, uh, so this Marine, he was stationed out in San Diego there at Camp Pendleton, and he got on an airplane there at the San Diego airport, and he got, went up there and got in first class and sat down and buckled himself up in first class. And the flight attendant went over and said, excuse me, sir, can I see your ticket? And he showed it to her. She said, sir, you don't understand. You're not in first class. You're in coach. He said, ma'am, I'm a Marine. I'm going to Boston, and I'm riding in first class. And she said, no, sir, you don't understand. Your ticket is for coach. Ma'am, I'm a Marine. I'm going to Boston. I'm riding in first class. She turned around and walked back to the front of the plane, and she just shook her head. The other flight attendant came up and said, what's the matter? She said, I cannot get this Marine to understand that he's got a coach ticket, and he wants to ride in first class. So the, she said, oh, let me handle this. She said, I'm married to a Marine. I'll handle it. She went back there and she knelt down and she whispered something to him. He unbuckled that seat belt, got up and took off back to the back and buckled up in coach. She came back to the front and the first flight attendant said, what did you say to him that I didn't say to him? She said, you got to understand how to handle these Marines. She said, I knelt down and said, sir, First class doesn't go to Boston. <laughs> you guys will get that in just a minute, you know. <laughs> I have a few more books left. This is my autobiography of my uh, years in the Delta Force, the Green Berets and the Rangers, and uh, it is my autobiography. So we've got a few out there. If you'll pick them up. Uh, on your way out, and I'll sign them for you. I think they're all signed, but I'll personalize them for you as we go out. So uh, there's trouble in the land, right? We see that. Well, let me uh, let me start with a little quiz. There we go. Hey, I'm acting like a Marine, huh? <laughs> really? It's too complicated. All right. Who and what's behind all the chaos in the nation today? Liberals? Antifa? Black Lives Matter? White supremacists? China? Russia? Yeah, a little bit of all of it. But what's the primary culprit? I've been talking about this for over a decade. I've been laughed at. I've been guffawed. 
I've been told that I'm a conspiracy theorist and all kinds of stuff. But here's what you need to understand. It's the Marxist movement in America. This movement in America is not new. It's been here for a long time, and it is now reaching its pinnacle. Yeah. And we need to understand that this movement is real. Yeah. And it is destroying America right now. This is what's behind what you see happening on our streets. Understand that Karl Marx and Frederick Engel wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848. They created in their own minds what they considered to be a perfect world, a utopia. And it's never been accomplished. Never. They told us what they intended for the future, not just of America, but the future of the world. This is what they wanted to see the whole world look like. Now we see it unfolding right here in America, exactly what they said they wanted. And then in 1958, 110 years later, a guy named Skousen with the Communist Party USA, PCUSA, CPUSA, wrote a book called The Naked Communist, and he told us exactly how the Communist Party would take over America. Okay? And we laughed at him. We laughed at them back in 1958. What were their objectives? To destroy America as we know it through anarchy and chaos, to recreate it as a Marxist communist state, and to establish a socialist economic system for this country. What are Marxism? Communism and socialism. I'm going to try to keep this from being confusing because I could get into a lot of detail. Many of, quite frequently, they're used synonymously. I, I do it myself sometimes. But communism is a totalitarian government, okay? Marxism is the political, communist political theory. Now, I know that's a little confusing. So to reduce the confusion, just call it Marxism or communism or Marxism slash communism, okay? It just makes it easier because they're basically the same thing. They go together. Marxism, again, is an ideal, but communism is the total or totalitarian government that that ideal fits into. They did not work the way Engels and Marx expected them to do. They've never worked the way they wrote in the Communist Manifesto. Never. Never. It's never succeeded. And then socialism as an economic system it always fails, and there is a new book out by two economists from uh, uh, credible universities. I'm not going to tell you the name of it because it might be offensive to somebody in here, but let's just say it's something like uh, Socialism Stinks, okay? You can find it in the bookshelves. And these two guys claim that there's only two socialist nations in the world today, Cuba and Venezuela. Uh, North Korea comes very close, but there's no private ownership in a socialist state. You see, we talk about Sweden being a socialist nation. No, Sweden's not a socialist nation. They have socialist policies, but they have private ownership. These guys write about how they went down to Cuba and then they went to Venezuela. And in those hotels, for example, that belonged to the government, they were abysmal. No running, no hot and cold running water dirty toilets because everybody gets paid the same. Nobody cares whether the place is maintained or anything like that. And then they did an experiment and they let private owners come in and buy hotels and renovate them. Now all the tourists that go down there stay in these private hotels. They won't stay in a government hotel. So that's the only two countries that are true socialist countries today according to these two guys. What did Karl Marx believe? He, he outlined his disdain for capitalism and he advocated revolution. See, he said also that religion is the opiate of the masses. He was a hardcore atheist. Karl Marx was an atheist. And he said, this is his famous quote, my objective is to dethrone God and to destroy capitalism. Dethrone God. You look at the attacks on the church today. You look at the restrictions on the church that don't apply to anybody else. You look at how they're trying to shut us down. Why is that? Because this is a Marxist movement. You cannot be a Marxist society if you believe that your rights are inalienable. Our founding fathers gave us two things that were unique. 
One was consent of the governed. The other was inalienable or unalienable rights. Okay, our rights come from God, not from the king, not from the caliph, not from the pharaoh. They come from God. You cannot believe your rights come from God and be a Marxist communist nation. You must believe that your rights come from the government, come from man. And that's why you see the all-out assault on Christianity primarily today is because we were founded on the Judeo-Christian principles of the Bible. Amen. Period. Amen. This is what they advocated. There are two types of people in the world, two classes of people. The workers are the proletariat. They have no control over production or the wealthy bourgeoisie, and they have total control over production. Today, that class warfare is giving way to race warfare. They've, they've, no longer are we dividing our country into uh, two social classes, the 99% versus the 1%. Have you ever heard that term before? Does that sound familiar? I said back when that, that was going on the Occupy Wall Street, this is part of the communist plan. And all you have to do, by the way, is go back to 1966, take a little, little bit of a break and look at the history of the, of the revolution in China that started in 1926. I mean, 1966, okay? It was called the Cultural Revolution. And you'll see exactly what you're seeing on the streets of America. In fact, to include tearing down monuments, monuments of anything that existed prior to the takeover by the communists of China. And you see the same thing happening in America. The Cultural Re Revolution in China. You see the same thing. And this 99... Uh, percent versus the one percent which was the Occupy Wall Street was all part of their plan and don't think that China and Russia are not funding a, a pretty good deal of this because they indeed are they're using race now it's not economic division it's race and that's what they're using to get this revolution going here's what Marx believed also now, this will show you how much of an atheist he was if you just read this. People will govern themselves without an elected central government. Can you imagine that? Just read, read Lord of the Ring. I mean, uh, Lord of the Flies sometimes. People are instinctively good and will do what is necessary for the greater good of their society. Does that sound biblical to you? What does the, what does the Bible say, Pastor? Men love darkness because their hearts are evil. Huh? We are not instinctively good. We are purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. But this notion that people are all good is not a biblical concept. No private ownership. And this is where he made his famous statement. From each according to his abilities to each according to his need. That is the redistribution of wealth. Have you heard of the redistribution of wealth? Or how about this income inequality that we're talking about now, you know? That's all part of the Marxist lingo. That's where this is coming from. Marx also believed in a utopian classless society. There is never going to be such a thing. Even in a communist, Marxist Nation, there is a ruling elite, a wealthy ruling elite. Do you think Vladimir Putin became one of the wealthiest men in the world just since the wall came down, just since the Soviet Union disintegrated? No, no. He made that money. He made much of that money while the Soviet Union existed. Okay? There is a wealthy ruling elite that just nobody talks about. It's never been achieved. Listen, look, I want you to look carefully at this. Take a picture of this, because you've got to take this home with you. This is what Joseph Stalin said, and I want you to think about it in the context of what you see happening in this country today. America is like a healthy body, and its resistance is threefold. It's patriotism, 
its morality, and its spiritual life. If we can undermine these three areas, America will collapse from within. Joseph Stalin. Now, as we go forward in this briefing, think about this statement because that's exactly what they attacked and that's exactly what they told us they were going to attack when they wrote the communist, I mean, when they wrote the uh, communist, not the communist manifestos, the naked communists in 1958. That's exactly what they've attacked, these three things. They have a plan to take over America Make it a communist nation, they're succeeding. Let's look at their strategy and see what they're going to do. Here's their game plan. Infiltrate the institutions of America and take over from within. That's what they're doing. They're take, they're not, this is not an invasion. There's some foreign money coming in. But it's not an invasion. They're going to defeat us from within. That's their plan. That's what they've been doing. Promote cohabitation versus marriage. Why? Why? Destroy the families. The most, the foundation of America is the family. The building block of this society is the family. You destroy the family, you destroy our society. And it's just as popular to live together now as it is to be married. And by the way, you've got couples sitting on the front pews of evangelical churches all over the nations today that are not married. And everybody knows they're not married, but nobody says a word to them about it. Get children away from families as soon as possible. Do you remember in the Obama administration when they were talking about universal daycare? Reza Gorbachev, when she wrote her doctoral thesis on child development, said this. The problem with Russian children is that they spend too much time at home with their families and they are introduced to too much mythology. What do you think the mythology was? the gospel of Jesus Christ, because the underground Orthodox Church was very much alive during the Soviet era, even though officially they were atheists. The underground church was very strong. In fact, they thrived. Not so today, but they thrived when they were under persecution. And uh, that's what she was talking about. They were exposed to too much mythology, too much Bible, too much God. This is an attempt to get your children away from you so that they can be indoctrinated. And that's why I'm glad that we, we beat down that whole universal daycare initiative. People recognize that, I think, for what it was. Support the feminist movement to create a disconnect with motherhood. Make women think that motherhood is just a burden. That's one of the reasons, one of the reasons we yep. killed 60 million babies in utero. Yep. Majo Dale, in the image of God, these children. And we've slaughtered them. And the governor of my state, Virginia, a pediatrician, has said, well, if the baby's born alive, we'll make it comfortable and then we'll have a discussion with the mother. That's murder. That's murder. And he's still the governor of my state. You tell me we haven't become diabolical in some ways. It is just, boy, it hurts. Support the environmental movement in order to destroy businesses. You talked about that, Bob, and how he's rolled back eight regulations. There have been points where it's as high as 22 regulations. At its very highest, 22 regulations he rolled back every time there was another one implemented. That was killing businesses. Part of their strategy was destroy morals by getting America to accept homosexuality. We're way beyond America accepting homosexuality. Now we have to celebrate it. We're being told to celebrate it because if we don't, we're bigots. Not me. I, uh, let me say this to everybody in here. It's still part of Romans 1. That's Romans right. 1 also talks about heterosexual sin. It also talks about fornication and adultery. And we need to make sure that we are hammering that just like we are this sexual sin. And then we're not distinguishing that as this this is as being different because it's all sexual sin. Okay? 
Eliminate prayer in school. You ever wonder where that came from? And keep in mind when it occurred. This, the book was written in 1958. Yep. And this prayer in school was in the early 60s, right? Didn't take them long. Again, going after the faith because you can't be a Marxist nation if you believe your rights are inalienable. Promote promise or discredit the family as an institution. Again, destroy the family. Destroy the family and you destroy the society. Promote promiscuity and easy divorce. Huh? Yeah. And there are places in the, in the country today, there are states, there are groups in different states trying to roll back this no-fault divorce because it is just, it's making it too easy for people to separate and, and divorce and leave those kids sort of as the victims of a, of a broken family. Get control of the schools through teachers' unions. The idea was if you control the union, you control the teachers. And if you control the teachers, you control the curriculum. Yep. You teach what you want to teach. And you see the next one, use the school curricula to promote socialism. That's what they've done. That's why over half of the millennials today believe that socialism is preferable to Communi I mean, to capitalism. The problem is they don't know what socialism is because it's been dressed up with bows put on it as it's been taught to them. Right. They don't know what socialism right. is. But they think that it means a free education. And somebody's going to pay off, you know, their, their, their insurance payments or something. And give them free insurance. But we need to understand that what we gave up in order to do that was history. American history. You see, half of the 20-year-olds uh, today are not proud to be Americans. And you know why? Because they don't know one thing about American history. You can graduate from a college or a university today without ever taking one American history course. <clears throat> they don't teach it in grammar school very often, only in some state. Texas is one of the states that requires, I think, and mandates uh, American history to be taught in order for you to graduate. It's a sad thing because there's an old Russian proverb that says, if you dwell in the past, you lose an eye. If you forget about the past, you lose both eyes. If you don't know where you came from, you sure don't know where you're going. And you cannot be proud to be an American if you don't know the sacrifices that this nation has paid. We have done some bad things. This country has done. I'm reading Bill O'Reilly's latest book, right now called Killing a Crazy Horse. And I, and I like O'Reilly's books. I don't particularly care for him, but I like his books. And this is abysmal because it's about the American Indians. And it's about some of the stuff that we did to the American Indians under the heading of Manifest Destiny. You think slavery was a problem, but we are a nation who recognizes our faults right. and does what we can to correct those yes. faults. We're a self-correcting society because we're free people. Right. We don't have to wait for a directive from the king. Eliminate obscenity laws and call it free speech. This was all about pornography, by the way. Eliminate obscenity laws. And remember, most of you are too young to remember this, but when they were doing this, they were trying to do this, figure all this out. They finally came to the point where they said, well, we can't really define obscenity, but we'll know it when we see it. I remember that. They were talking specifically about pornography. Right now, Doc, Josh McDowell, go to Josh McDowell's website. You want to see how bad pornography is in this country right now? It's not just men, it's women too. And it's, and it's affecting churches in a huge way, from what I'm told, by pastors. Yep. He says 74% of the families in the evangelical church today have somebody in that family that has a problem with pornography. Came out of the Communist Party USA's plan for America. I'm not even going to try to explain that to you. Here's another one of their strategies. Discredit the opposition. Now, how many of you remember in 2011 when the Department of Homeland Security came out with a memo saying that the future threats to America are, do you remember what they said? Huh? Evangelical Christians that believe in the second coming of Christ, 
Second Amendment groups and returning veterans. Future threats to America. Hey, yo, bro, they got me in all three categories. All three categories. I guarantee you there's not a person in here tonight that didn't get hit by that in all three categories. Well, you discredit the opposition because these are the very people that would stand up against you and fight against what you're trying to do to their nation. Come on. Criticism of the Supreme Court, remember that? That was the opposition. Uh, remember when uh, President Obama stood up with the Supreme Court sitting right there during his State of the Union speech and he criticized them? That's never been done before. It's never been done before. But he criticized them because they were the opposition. You see, they were, at that time, they still had uh, a, a, a real conservative in the court before he died. And uh, they were opposition. The media attacks on conservatives today, I mean, just, have you ever seen anything like this? How about the cancel culture? Hey, I've been canceled uh, multiple times. <laughs> multiple times. I got canceled at West Point. I couldn't go speak or do a prayer breakfast at West Point because I was a radical evangelical Christian. I got canceled at Fort Bragg. I spent 22 years. That's the home of special operations. I spent 22 years there, and I got canceled at speaking there at Fort Bragg. I got canceled at Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, and then I got fired from a college that I had taught at for 10 years because I had a bad attitude about letting men go in a women's shower. And the LGBT community came out against me and the leadership of the school fired me because of my bad attitude about letting men go into women's showers. Well, this cancel culture is a very serious issue here. Yes, is. Because what is hate speech? It's anything that you don't agree with. That's the way it is now. Anything you don't agree with, that's hate speech. And how about the relentless media attacks? You just talked about it earlier, Bob. Just the relentless attacks on Donald Trump. I don't know how he stands. I don't know how his blood pressure stays under control. Honestly. And if it was me, I, I would, I, I couldn't, I mean, I'd have to hurt somebody. <laughs> you know, really. Now, here's part of the strategy too, which is nationalize major sectors of the economy. Now, just think about this. We did auto bailouts, bank bailouts, insurance bailouts. Those were major sectors of the economy. The good news is the American economy is so strong, we bounced back. They paid the money back, and we didn't, the government didn't own them. See, if the government could own them and control them, then the government could control most of society. Here's another one, censorship, hate crimes legislation. Again, this is, the, this, is, this is the most bogus thing I've seen because nobody can define a hate crime. And it always comes down to what I just said a few minutes ago. It's if you don't agree with me, you call me a racist, you call me a hater, you call me all of these things. They've got a whole litany of things that they can call me. And, and by the way, that's what they'll do to you too. If they can't beat you in terms of the substance of their argument, they will go to race baiting you, they will go to uh, smearing your, you personally. It's just the way it is, and I get it all the time. But as Rick said, I, I want a legacy, wait a minute, I want a legacy for my grandchildren. I want them to know, and in fact, I got another book that just came out, it's, and, and we sold them all earlier today, so I didn't have it. It's, a man, it's called Man to Man. It's a book for men, and it's about, it's trying to overcome this toxic masculinity. And I go right straight at it. It is not politically correct. My publisher called me and told me, he said, you are going to get your behind kicked over this book. I said, that's where I want to be. Yeah. I want to be there. But I'm going right at this whole thing of men, right? Being what men, you know, your plumbing is different. And that's for a reason. You're supposed to, you're supposed to stand up. Yes. You're supposed to stand up and be a warrior. God, God yes. birthed you to be a warrior. Yeah. And today we got these men that they want to be a woman. They, they, they think they can be a woman. 
I could tell you how to figure out what you are real quick, but I won't because we got some youngsters in here. So, <laughs> But I suspect they could tell you how to figure out whether you're a man or a woman too. That said, uh, hate, hate crimes, it's bogus. It's totally bogus. The Fairness Doctrine, if you do 30 minutes of conservative radio, you got to do 30 minutes of... Uh, of liberal radio and nobody listens to liberal radio but that was part of what was that was part of what was pushed remember the the fairness doctrine social media censorship don't think for a minute how many of you have been knocked off of facebook or twitter yeah well the rest of you are punks then because you ought to be out there doing something controversial <laughs> so you get not man when you get knocked off you gotta you wear it like a badge of honor okay Big tech censorship, firing conservative professors. You, it's hard to find a conservative professor in any university today. And by the way, that includes Christian universities. Come on. Yeah. That includes Christian universities. I mean, they're moving. I speak at Christian universities. That's the only place that'll have me in terms of universities. And there are some good ones that are, 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 have maintained. In fact, one of them is called College of the Ozarks. And that's the president up there. Jerry Davis is his name. He's, he's my age, and he's the one that when, when uh, Nike went squirrely and, and jumped in behind, you know, the LGBT community, he made a public statement and said, we are getting rid of all Nike products here. And when they started this kneeling for the flag, he said, if you come on this campus to play an athletic event and you don't stand for the flag, there will be no athletic event. And everybody said... Everybody said, you, oh, you go, you, we'll never get another donation for this school. And the guy that works for Bass Pro Shop that sets up their golf tournaments told me, and, and at College of the Ozarks is in Branson, Missouri, okay? And this guy told me there were private planes coming in there landing at that little airfield in Branson, Missouri, bringing Jerry Davis cash. Come on. Bringing him cash. Said they had more money than they'd ever had in the history of of College of the Ozark because he took a stand. Americans still respect strength. Yes. They still respect people that take a stand and yes. won't back down. Where we lose is when we take a stand and then we say, well, I just didn't want to offend anybody. I better, I didn't mean it exactly that way. Don't do that. Stand for what you believe in. But first of all, know what you believe in Come on. and know why you believe it. And then be ready to stand. Get you some, get you a pack of those MP3s and study those topics. Look at the topics on there. Yeah. Look at the topics on there. I just said to him, I was just going to get one. Now he says he's going to send them all to me. So here, I'll trade you. <laughs> okay? A book. All right. Destroying religion of the nation. These restrictions are just unbelievable, and then pastors are being taken to court and fined. And I'm leaving Sunday to uh, tomorrow. I'll be down in Heartland with uh, Chris, uh, Chris, Pastor Chris Tome. I'll be down there with him, and uh, Sheriff Dave Clark will be there, and Denish D'Souza, and uh, we've got some other speakers down there. We'll be, but then Sunday I'm going to California, and we're going to bring in some of these pastors that have been uh, fined and taken to court and all. For holding services uh, when you got a, a communist governor in the state of California. And that's exactly what he is. And how about Antifa? Are they Marxist? Absolutely. They were founded in the 30s during the Weimar Republic, and they were founded as an overtly communist organization. Do you understand that? They were founded as a communist organization. They advocate for violence, and they were founded to oppose these three men. Okay, that sounds pretty good, but let's watch. Let, let's see something here. There's cells throughout America. they got cells all over this country, Antifa cells. Their operatives are armed and ruthless. They're targeting law enforcement, and their definition of fascism, anti-fascist, anti-fascism, their definition of fascism has The evolved. original Antifa groups in Europe formed to combat this man, Mussolini. And when he rose to power, Adolf Hitler. Bad guys, 
I want to be a part of a group that's fighting against those guys. Antifa says they are fighting the same form of fascism in America today. However, their definition of fascism has expanded over time. For instance, this is how Yvette Falarka defines it. Now, she's the leader of an Antifa group in California called By Any Means Necessary. What is a fascist? So a fascist is someone who's organizing a mass movement that's attacking women, immigrants, black people, other minority groups in a movement of genocide. That's what a fascist is. Okay, so it's someone who's committing violence? And it's someone who's committing violence and who's trying to organize other people to commit violence. Did you hear that? They're committing violence or, organ or, or trying to encourage other people to commit violence. She just said, we're doing exactly what we say we're standing against because they are the ones that go out to these marches and organize people to start breaking windows and hurting people and rioting in the streets. They're the rabble rousers. And they're all over this country, little cells all over the country. But they're the ones, and by the way, disregard what the media tells you when the media says, no, they don't drop bricks out there in water. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And the evidence of it is abundant. Peaceful protest. And they'll go in and drop a big load of bricks and they'll drop water so that they can sustain themselves as long as they're rioting. Yeah, these are some bad people. And she just admitted that they are doing exactly what they say they're standing against because they're organizing people to violent behavior. Black Lives Matter It's also a Marxist organization that has consistently called for the killing of law enforcement officers. Pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. How many of you remember that? Right. What do we want? Dead cops. When do we want them? Now. That's Black Lives Matter. Now, by the way, remember that it's Black Lives Matter Incorporated. This is actually an incorporated business. You realize that? They've actually, they are actually an incorporated business. Okay? Black Lives Matter, they are a Marxist organization. I think that Listen to one of the, the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might, um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super... Uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. Did you hear what she said? We are trained Marxist. Did you hear that? Okay. I drive by a church every day on my way home from my office in Washington, D.C. An old, well-established mainline religion church and they got a big Black Lives Matter sign out front and they're real proud of it. And you know what I think? You poor people. You don't realize you're supporting Marxism, communism. And if they get into power, you won't be able to worship. You'll be, you'll be just like the churches in the Soviet Union. You're going to have to go under crown. By the way, the other thing is this. Watch one, of these, watch one of these riots out there when they're looting and rioting and all that. You're going to see as many or more white people out there right. as you do blacks. Right. Huh? And most of them are young. Right. And most of them think they're purging their soul. They're, they're showing America because of the evil that we've committed. And they come away feeling good about themselves. Yeah, right. Yeah, you've really done something great for America. You've really done something great for those people out there in the street. No. You haven't done anything but humiliate yourself. And one day you'll look back on it and realize, hopefully, how foolish you were to think that you can, you can get out there and, and, and rob and beat people up and steal from people and think that you've accomplished anything at all. Except maybe you got a big screen TV out of the deal or something. A lot of black leaders are speaking out about it. I'll be with us, Sheriff Clark tomorrow. And most of you know Sheriff Dave Clark from Wisconsin County. And he's going to stand up there and tell the audience, 
Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization, and you need to understand that it's a Marxist organization. Not everyone participating is a Marxist, and many are trying to conduct peaceful assemblies as the Constitution allows. But what does the Constitution say in the First Amendment? Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people. What's the next word? Peaceably to assemble and to petition their government for the redress of grievances. Peaceably. You have the right to assemble. You have the right to petition your government. But a peaceful protest does not include breaking windows out of stores and stealing what belongs to somebody else or shooting somebody or beating somebody up. That is not a peaceful protest. Amen. But you get Antifa in there and they start stirring up passions and then once they break the first window, it's, it's downhill from there. Three distinct groups. You got the peaceful protesters seeking social justice. You got Antifa operatives that are fomenting violence. And you got the criminals and the thugs that are just out there looting. They don't care about, they don't have a cause except to get as much as they can. And you got a plenty of them that fall in on one of these peaceful protests right. and just wait for it to get out of hand so they can get theirs. What do we do? Get informed. And by the way, if you watch CNN, MSNBC, or Fox News and nothing else, you ain't getting the whole picture. And I do Fox. In fact, I, they called me and wanted me to do Fox tomorrow morning with, with uh, Neil Cavuto, and I had to turn him down because I'm at this other thing. So I do Fox. And I, but if, you, if that's all you're doing to get your information, you need to go to online sources. You need to go to other sources, and there's some good credible sources to get to. But don't get into conspiracy theory because there's an awful lot of that out there. You can get duped and you can, be, you can be made to look like a fool very quickly. So don't get into conspiracy theory, but use multiple sources. Vote. The most fundamental right that our founding fathers gave us was to vote. Amen. Bob talked about it. If you don't vote, the Bible says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. What, who is Caesar? Our Constitution, the Constitution of the United States, that's what makes us a constitutional republic. We have an obligation as Christians and as patriotic Americans to go and vote. And the fact that we've got, we had 25 million evangelical Christians that didn't vote in the last election is absolutely scandalous. And, and, and I will tell you, it's unbiblical for you not to vote as far as I'm concerned. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. We have to vote. Amen. Support your candidates. Find the candidates that you can, you can stand with, that you can volunteer your time, you can volunteer money, you can support their campaigns. And then if you need to, go run for office yourself. Hold your leaders accountable. Call them, email them, but don't let them off the hook. My wife bugged my congressman until one night we were, we were both speaking on the same platform and he went to her and said, Ms. Boykin, I understand you don't have to keep emailing me and calling my office. And, and she said, I'll stop when you do what I want you to do. <laughs> you know what? He, he wound up that lamp, wound up being his last term. He left Congress. I guess he got tired of her calling him. I don't know what it was, but <laughs> he actually left, stepped down. Stand and be counted. Speak out. Don't be intimidated by people that say something bad about you. Doggone it. Stand up. You ever, what do you think? I mean, here's a preacher. He is always going to have somebody saying something bad about him. And sometimes it's people in the church. But look, I know what it's like to live under a microscope. I know what it's like to have people say bad things about you. But let me tell you what. When I stop and think, my ultimate accountability is that day that I'm going to stand before him. They call it the judgment seat of Christ. Huh? Not the great white throne judgment. Man, I'm beyond that. I'm redeemed. But I'm going to stand in the judgment seat of Christ. That's my ultimate accountability. And then stand and be counted. Run for office. And by the way, run for the school board. Get somebody that you really trust and get them on the school board. That's how you, that's how you really have an impact on the curriculum. And the other one is this. <clears throat> the sheriff. Sheriffs are the highest law enforcement, elected law enforcement official in the nation, and they have unbelievable authority. 
We need to get in behind sheriffs. We need to get people running for sheriff. And, and, and if, a, if, if your mayor says uh, you can't sing in church, as was what happened in California, and that sheriff says, I'm not enforcing that, you're good to go. You're good. If he won't enforce it, you're good to go. Isaiah 520, woe unto you, woe unto you who call good evil and evil good. We have got to quit calling good evil and evil good. We've got to focus on that. Change the dialogue back. No, abortion is abortion. It's not choice. Same-sex marriage is still same-sex marriage. It is not marriage equality. And we cannot keep doing that. Psalms 94 If you think you're not supposed to act, Psalms 94 ought to convince you. Verse 16, who will rise up against this evil for me? Who will take a stand against these doers of iniquity? That's a call to action for us. We stand against evil. In Deuteronomy 20, Jesus, I mean, uh, Moses was leaving instructions for the Israelites after he went to be with the fathers. And he said, and when you're going into battle, the officers will come forward and they'll say, is any man just taking a new bride? Let him go home. Is any man just planted a new vineyard? Let him go home. Is any man afraid? Go home. Because your fear will strike fear in the hearts of these other warriors. Let me tell you, when you go and, and ask the old brother so-and-so to, come on, brother, let's go down to the, let's go down to the city hall here because they're about to pass a city ordinance that says men can go in women's bathrooms and we ain't going to stand for that so let's get our let's get our, and old brother so and so says well you know I'm with you now I'm with you on that but you know I got a business and I I, I, I don't want to offend anybody you just shake the dust off shake the dust off and let old brother go sit in the corner and suck his thumb because he ain't going to get any braver that's right you know cowards don't get brave suddenly when the shooting starts I can tell you that from experience so you find the warriors around you. You surround yourself with those warriors and you go into the battle unafraid because God sends his angels ahead of you. Amen. And that is biblical. And then finally, there's nothing more important that we can do for our, our country than to pray. Amen. We need to be praying, I mean, fervent prayer. And I don't mean just between now and October 3rd, I mean November 3rd, this needs to be a continual thing. Amen. A continual thing. We need to be praying for this country and for our leaders because Satan, I'm telling you, Satan has been loosed in my view for a season here. And I think it's this sifting. I think it's this, it's what the pastor talked about earlier up here. There's a shaking yep. right now. And here's an opportunity, an opportunity for us to shine as the church. An opportunity for us. I was standing outside my hotel last night waiting for somebody to come pick me up. And there was a guy out there, I'm telling you, he had a braided beard and he had pale big things hanging out of his ears. And he was smoking a cigarette. And, and I just sensed, the Lord just laid it on my heart, there's something wrong with him. He's burdened over something. And I started talking to him. And come to find out that his girlfriend of three years had just left him and he was right on the verge of suicide. He, was, he had come and checked in at this hotel there, I guess, so he wouldn't do it at, at his aunt's house where he lived. And uh, I just, I just lay, laid my hand up on his shoulder and I put my arm around him. I said, can I pray for you? And he began to weep. Be ready in season and out of season. Yeah. Because you never know when God's going to use you. But you got to be in the Word. You got to be ready. You got to be ready to walk up to somebody that you don't know and say, Can I pray for you? If God tells you, go pray for that person. It's been my honor to be with you tonight, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you. General Boykin, you told the story on the last two days, and I like it, about the, that battle in World War II. 
Well, I think I think I think people need to hear that. I'd like okay, you to, I was just please. worried about the pastor throwing me out of the church. For this <laughs> time, but you'll have to. This is the way the story. I mean, how many of you have ever heard of the 82nd Airborne Division? Okay, if you go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, home of the 82nd Airborne Division, and you go in their museum, you will see a, a big display of a guy named PFC Martin. PFC Martin was in the 82nd Airborne Division in the Second World War. And uh, in December of 1944, the 101st Airborne Division was surrounded in a town called Bastogne. You know it as the Battle of the Bulge. They were completely surrounded. In fact, the Germans had them about five to one, had them surrounded. And the 82nd Airborne Division was called to come forward and try and bust into the city and, and help relieve the 101st. But the 6th Armored Division was making its way out of Bastogne, rolling as fast as it could down this highway, trying to get away from Bastogne. And the uh, lead tank, or is actually a tank destroyer, rolled up on this ragged private first class with an 82nd Airborne Division patch on his shoulder right by himself. He's digging, he's digging, he's digging a hole. And the guy, the, the tank commander rolls up and he pops open his cupola and he steps out and he looks down and he said, hey, what are you doing? Don't you know the Germans are coming? PFC Martin looked up and said, I'm digging a foxhole. He said, man, the Germans are coming. And he said, are you looking for a safe place? And the tank commander said, yeah. He said, fall in right here behind me. I'm the 82nd Airborne, and this is as far as these bastards are going. <laughs> we ought to be the 82nd Airborne. We ought to be the ones that are saying they ain't going any further. We need to stop what I just showed you is going on in this country today. God bless you. Well, you, you are the radical remnant, and remnants always shift history all the time. And I'll tell you what, there's a line in Judah and us that's greater than the enemy that we face out there. So be encouraged. We're going to win this thing. I had a lady email me, email, or, uh, yeah, email me this, uh, this afternoon because we're doing a night watch now with Sarah Ballinger and the Capitol Hill Prayer Partners working with her in D.C. where we're having prayer teams from 12 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6, having using conference call technology, praying in the night. You know, evil, most evil manifest in the night. Islam doesn't pray in the night. And I had a lady email me, she said, I want that 2 to 4 a.m. shift. Could you put me in? You can have it. <laughs> Because a lot of people don't want it. But the airborne is here, the intercession. Now God is calling us to action. So I want to thank you, Bob, for your voice on the radio. And uh, I'm not letting you go because uh, we're going to combine here with J.P. Kraft and all what we're doing. And Pastor Richard, what you shared with me. We're going to move ahead. This is one of my favorite places to be, Pastor Richard.